Welcome and thank you for joining us for this Flinders University Brave mini lecture series event titled Braving COVID, where we'll explore all sorts of things related to the current COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Karen Ashford and I'm delighted to be your MC today. Above all else, I'd like to acknowledge that we're hosting this forum on the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge and convey our deep appreciation to the elders of all the nations upon which Flinders operates. Today's event is delivered as part of our Brave lecture series, so named because through this series, we showcase our researchers who challenge the status quo and bravely investigate with a view to resolve some of the big societal challenges of our time. This online Brave mini series aims to instill information and inspiration in rapidly changing, challenging times. A reminder, if you can't stay for the duration of the live stream, you can watch our recording later via our website, flinders.edu.au. As always, we're keen to make this an interactive event with a live Q&A session. It's your chance to participate in the discussion and to pose questions to the speaker in real time. We do ask, however, that everyone treats this forum as a place of respectful engagement, where people are treated with dignity and where differing views are tolerated. We're ready to start receiving your questions now via the message function on this platform, or you can join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag BraveResearch. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you today's expert speaker, Professor Jonathan Craig. Our Matthew Flinders Distinguished Professor Jonathan Craig is an internationally recognised clinician and scientist and Vice President and Executive Dean of the College of Medicine and Public Health at Flinders University. He has made a significant contribution to the clinical research landscape in the prevention, identification, management and treatment of chronic kidney disease, particularly in relation to children and in Indigenous communities. He has a large number of advisory roles, including the National Health and Medical Research Council's Health Translation Advisory Committee, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, Medical Services Advisory Committee, and Commonwealth Department of Health Life Saving Drug Program. Professor Craig's knowledge has contributed to global health improvements, including as a past member of the WHO Expert Review Panel for Global Strategy and Plan of Action on Public Health innovation and intellectual property. I'd like to invite Professor Craig to deliver today's mini lecture titled Braving COVID, an update on national and global trends, treatments and vaccines. Over to you, Jonathan. Dear Karen, uh, thank you and thank everyone for joining us. As Karen said, it's my great pleasure to bring uh, this lecture to you. But up front, I just want to acknowledge that although I'm going to be talking about people and numbers, I want to recognise that this pandemic has had a really profound impact uh, on all of us in so many uh, different ways and shapes. Like Karen, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet here in Adelaide, on the lands of the Ghana people, but acknowledge that Flinders has had uh, and will have a very large footprint across a lot of South Australia and into the Territory, and that involves the tra traditional custodians of many lands. Uh, and as uh, recently through NAIDOT week, always was, always will be. So my conflict of interest, Karen has gone through some of this. I'm employed at Flinders University. Uh, I do have a number of responsibilities, particularly with the Commonwealth in relation to advising the Minister of Health about uh, health technology assessment, both drugs, tests uh, and devices. I want to also acknowledge that I'm a member of the Australian Living Evidence Consortium and that one of our researchers, Nikolai Petrovsky, who's got academic status, uh, is working on developing a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So these are the things I'd be keen to talk about in the next uh, 35 minutes or so. Some of the background to do with the particular virus and COVID-19, the illness that's caused by, that uh, is caused by SARS-CoV-2, talk about some of the epidemiology, some of the evidence on treatments and vaccines, 
and finish with implications for the future. This is a lot to cover, uh, but thank you for taking the journey with me. There are some things that will be out of scope. I'm not going to talk about the university response to the pandemic. This is the responsibility of the vice chancellor and the care, the chair of the university task force, uh, Professor Claire Pollock. Also, I'm not going to provide any narrative in relation to the Commonwealth, South Australia, NT or, uh, or indeed any other jurisdiction health responses. Uh, these people make decisions based upon the totality of the evidence uh, and I, as a member of the public, uh, albeit an expert in some of this area, are not privy to that. Caveats, this doesn't replace individual medical advice. Uh, note the recommendations from the Australian Chief Medical Officer, local jurisdictions, as you'd be very, very well aware by now, this is rapidly evolving, and I just want to provide some information in relation to my sources. So, just as context, uh, this is a uh, from 1919 when the so-called Spanish flu uh, came to Australia. You'll note that many of the comments that were here uh, came from, which was the from the Maruya Historical Society, which is a small town in southern New South Wales. Many of these things are common to us now. Here, the Victorian and the federal governments are strongly protesting the action of the New South Wales government in closing the border to traffic. They claim it a violation. You can see that there are numbers now talking about Queenslanders finding it difficult. So the first thing is that the world has had a pandemic. Uh, previously, that was the Spanish flu around 1918-1919. And again, as part of the context that led to 500 million people infected, 50 million people died, which at that time was around a third of the world's population. So background information, and this is COVID-19, the virus, and you can see that it has certain characteristics which enable it to cause infection. Uh, you can see these little uh, protrusions, these are the so-called spike proteins that adhere to the respiratory tract of people. So COVID-19 is the disease, the disease that causes pneumonia and other complications throughout the body. It's caused by the virus, which is called the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's a coronavirus, it's, which is a large single-stranded RNA virus. It's found widely in humans and many animal species. The most frequent illness actually that causes is the common cold. And when I went to medical school, I learned very early on that coronavirus probably didn't really matter to anybody. It was just one of those things. However, it has caused uh, not only one, but three major serious diseases in the last two decades. Firstly, with the first SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS-CoV, which occurred in 2002 to 2003, around 8,000 people affected, and then Middle East respiratory syndrome, so-called MERS, in 2012, which affected fewer people at around 2,000, uh, but the case fatality rate from that particular uh, virus was very substantial at around 30%. So, how does it cause illness? Well, the spike protein, which I showed you before, binds to a receptor in this respiratory tract called the ACE2 receptor. This enables the virus to enter the host cell, uh, which then allows it to multiply within the host cell and causing inflammation and damage. And the thing that appears to cause most amount of damage is in fact the human's own response to rid itself of the virus, but unfortunately causes damage to itself. This is what the virus looks like. The, all those yellow uh, circles, spheres you can see uh, is the virus. This has been replicating within the respiratory tract and those finger protrusions you can see are part of the normal respiratory tract of, of humans. So transmission, I think it's important that we all understand the, the process for transmission, which makes some, hopefully makes more sense of the public health response, which has been so inevident. 
So it is spread primarily via respiratory droplets during face-to-face -face contact. That So contact could include talking, coughing, sneezing. There is some fomite, which is another technical way of just saying surface, and there are some aerosol transmissions. Aerosols are very small, small droplets that hang in the air for a long period of time, but the primary mechanism of transmission is via the respiratory droplet. The risk of transmission, however, varies. It's not constant, and it varies depending on how far people are away from someone who's carrying the virus. So if they are closer, then they're more likely to be infected. If they're exposed for a longer period, uh, more than let's say 15 minutes, which is the typical period, then the uh, risk of transmission increases and, and the stage of the disease. So in particular, if one has got symptoms, then the likelihood of transmitting to another person is increased. The incubation period, which is defined as the period from exposure to the virus from someone who has the infection to symptoms has a range, but the mean is around five days. So about five days between exposure and developing symptoms, which typically are things like fever uh, or a dry cough, but can be up to 14 days, which is why you will have seen uh, at length why the 14 day uh, quarantine period is required, which means that if you haven't um, developed symptoms or infection by the, four by the day 14, you're exceedingly unlikely to get them. Now, transmission can occur from asymptomatic people. So we think that maybe around five to 7% of people who have COVID-19 have very mild symptoms or none at all. Pre-symptomatic, which is a day or two developing symptoms or the symptoms of the nature I said, which is the fever and dry cough. The virus does begin to shed from respiratory tract of people from about two to three days pre-symptoms. So that, for example, one might get infected on day zero um, and start to shed by day two or three. Why that period? Because it takes the virus a certain amount of time to replicate to the point that it can shed and peaks with symptoms. Shedding stops about one week after symptoms resolve. So what's the implications of this? Well, the implications are that this, this shows uh, uh, what the uh, the potential impact of an effective track and trace and isolation system. So here in this figure, we have a person A who gets infected, sorry, who gets infected, develops symptoms, and then infects person B and person C. They're subsequently isolated. So they have passed on their infection to two people, person B and person C. Person B, we have an effective tra tra track and trace system and an isolation, which means that very soon uh, before they have a chance to infect uh, two potential people, they're isolated, which means they don't pass their illness on to anybody else. If we don't have an effective track and trace system, such as which occurs in person C, they go on to infect person D, E and F. So that one person has infected three people because they haven't been isolated in a timely manner. And the, the time between infection and isolation is absolutely critical. The longer it is, the more likely that person will infect other people and increase the likelihood of more of more people being infected. So what do we know about the epidemiology globally in Australia and South Australia? Probably before uh, the, the whole pandemic occurred, nobody ever thought about epidemiology much or indeed public health. Epidemiology is, and this is Greek, it's about 
uh, upon or among study of people. So this is focused more on the study of people as a whole and the implications. This is data from the WHO um, as established uh, uh, on the 21st of November. This plots the, the number of people who have been infected over a weekly period. You can see the uh, pandemic started in December uh, and this is the numbers that we're up to and it corresponds to around 4 million people per week uh, being infected. In terms of the numbers of deaths, you can see on the bottom graph here that the number of people who are unfortunately dying of COVID-19 is around 60,000. The total number of those cases uh, due to COVID-19 is around 57 million and the number of deaths around 1.4 million. Where do these infections, where have they occurred across the world? The WHO divides the world up into uh, six regions. They're all color coded here. You can see the Americas is the top one, which is in yellow, Europe in green, Southeast Asia in purple, and Australia is part of the Western Pacific, which is at the bottom number here you can see. You can see here that overall the most number of infections has occurred in the Americas. That includes both North America and South America, but you can see over the last few weeks or so, the number of cases in Europe has uh, expanded uh, quite dramatically. What about the, the deaths by region? You can see again that Americas predominate with around uh, 700,000, but you can also see that uh, the Europe's, that Europe is now starting to catch up, unfortunately. What about uh, in Australia? So this graph shows two things. Uh, one, it shows the new cases occurring in the uh, blue. This shows the so-called first wave that occurred in Australia around uh, March and April, and the second wave which peaked uh, in July and August, which was largely the Victorian second wave at around uh, 750. Uh, the uh, orange line describes the total number of cases. So the first wave we had around 850 or thereabouts, and now we have around uh, 28,000 who have uh, been infected with this particular virus. How does this compare across the world? So here I've selected some countries uh, who share some similarities with the Australian healthcare system. Uh, with this graph is standardized per million people so that we can compare like with like rather than compare small countries compared to bigger countries. We can see that uh, the USA has got around 35,000 confirmed cases per million, followed by Brazil, United Kingdom and the others. You can see Australia here is it, uh, joins a very privileged cluster along with Australia, Japan, South Korea and New Zealand. This gives you a sense of how well uh, Australia has managed uh, this particular pandemic. If we then compare a log scale, so unlike a linear scale where each of the marks are the same for a log scale, each of these lines here uh, differ by a factor of 10. This allows us to compare uh, countries which have got much lower cases. You can see here, sorry, you can see here that Australia has ended up with around 28,000 cases or around 1,000 per million or around one case for every thousand people. You can see that uh, Australia is one of the few countries that uh, has fared well and does compare with Japan, South Korea and New Zealand. What about the number of deaths per million? Again, this graph is on a linear scale. You can see that United Kingdom, Brazil and United States haven't fared so well with numbers approaching around 800 per million. 
Uh, at the far end, you can see Australia, Japan, South Korea, New Zealand and Singapore uh, very much less affected. Again, if we can compare via a log scale, you can see here again, Australia has fed fairly well. Uh, of course, any death due to COVID-19 is a tragedy and I don't want to belittle uh, these numbers at all, but relatively speaking has fared well. Of the 907 deaths to date, 814 have unfortunately occurred in Victoria. Put another way, this means around 36 per million or one death for every uh, 30,000 uh, people. This graph looks at the number of tests that have been done and what one could argue why are we interested in the number of tests? Well, uh, unless one test, one can't determine whether someone has been infected or not. So a robust public health res response would be demonstrated by a, a, a substantial number of tests being conducted. This graph plots the number, the cumulative tests per thousand people. There are some differences based upon uh, um, um, country by country reporting. You can see here in Australia, this is around uh, 400 uh, cases, 400 tests per thousand people, or in absolute terms around 9.6 million tests. Again, uh, if we can compare this across the world, in this case we're comparing the number of tests per confirmed case. You can see here again, Australia demonstrates that as a collective that we have had a number of tests done per infected, per confirmed case. Why has there been a reduction around August? That wasn't because there were fewer tests done, it's because there was more cases done. This corresponds with the Victorian second wave. So how can we summarise how Australia has done? Well, it's fared very favourably compared with almost all other countries in the world. The relative high rate of testing indicates that the case numbers are very likely to be accurate. And this represents a very effective public health response by the health authorities and the Australian public because indeed it's the Australian public who have been so responsive to the recommendations by the health authorities. I now want to change tack and look at those people in Australia who have unfortunately been infected with SARS-CoV-2. This is a graph on the x-axis has the age group uh, stratified by male in blue and female in, uh, in orange. You can see that actually contrary to what some people might have thought, this is primarily a disease of younger people with the peak incidence occurring um, in the under 50s. However, if one looks at those who have died, unfortunately it's primarily a illness that causes death in the elderly with very few under the age of 70 and those who did die under the age of 70 were predominantly those who had a number of pre-existing illnesses and so their immune system started off uh, not being as effective and as it otherwise might. This slide demonstrates where the infections have come from and again it's color coded where blue denotes overseas acquired, orange local unknown contact. This is also known as community transmission. That means that we don't know where the virus has come from. If we don't know where the virus has come from, we can't track, trace and isolate because we don't know who to effectively isolate. The green is the local known contact and you can see quite striking differences based upon the jurisdictions in terms of the uh, source of infection. In Victoria, where the case numbers have been substantial, you can see that the majority have been local known contact, but also 3,700 unknown local uh, sources. And that means that the, the individual track and trace response can't work. It means the more uh, restrictive uh, 
generic approaches to uh, movement, work and the like have been required. In New South Wales, interestingly, the largest number still are those who are acquired, but also they've had a, a number of local unknown contacts and local known contacts. South Australia, you can see the numbers are substantially less here. Uh, 555, but I do want to emphasize that in that 555 have included local known transmission even prior to the, the parafield cluster that has been so uh, talked about over the last week and has also included uh, three unknown transmissions. Cases in residential aged care follows the comments I made earlier about uh, deaths. And what we can see here is that unfortunately, the virus did make its way into the residential aged care facilities of primarily uh, Victoria, and that led to the large number of uh, deaths uh, in uh, the older population. You can see that New South Wales did have some uh, impact relatively early on, but that was did, did not appear to be the case in the other jurisdictions. Let's turn our attention to what's happened over the last couple of weeks. This slide gives a summary of the new cases by state and territory. A colour coded where South Australia is in the green uh, and New South Wales, which is the predominant colour here is in the black and you can see that this uh, corresponds to the paraf so-called parafleal cluster uh, which was uh, happened or peaked last weekend. Uh, you can also see from this graph that South Australia has had a number of new cases over the last few weeks uh, indeed months but that this was restricted here to overseas acquired, which were in so-called MIDI hotels. This graph shows you the, the known local uh, sources. Again, the parafield cluster. Uh, I understand that if we were to update the slide, there were nine new cases today across Australia, one of which occurred uh, in South Australia, who was uh, currently in uh, uh, quarantine with the remainder five from New South Wales and one from uh, Queensland. You can see that uh, if I, we referred to the earlier comments I made about incubation, if we were going to see an increase in number, given that there's a lag on average of around five from five days from infection through to development of symptoms, we would have seen increased numbers. So this this confirms uh, that the South Australian public health response has been very robust. And I do want to emphasize here that there was no, there has been no unknown local transmission, so-called community transmission, which is so important. So that's the epidemiology. Uh, I'm going to turn uh, just to close to talk about things that we can do, distancing, mass treatment and vaccines. And again, I want to highlight a uh, some interesting information from 1919, uh, slaying the germs. The influenza authorities agree that a mouth and throat spray of sulfate of zinc is preventative of influenza. And many Sydney houses are installing ventilation chambers for the benefit of their staff and country visitors. So in a climate such as COVID-19 with so much uncertainty and angst, it is a very uh, fertile environment for many claims of interventions and whether they're effective or not. Sadly, as we'll see, of the many drugs that have been provided, uh, virtually only one has been found to be uh, effective. It is a very, very hot space. There is a massive evident pipeline. This is a summary of new data. So at least around 30,000 studies, at least 838 in the last week. Uh, these randomized trials, which are the highest form of evidence, where we get fair comparisons of one versus another, 2,000 registered trials, 47 added this week. 
2,500 systematic reviews which draw together all of the information on a particular intervention. So uh, the, the, there has been an enormous amount of research that has gone into uh, developing interventions which are effective. But I would note that the vast majority of these trials, of these studies have been around drugs. Probably the more important elements, which are the behavioral, environmental, social and systems uh, interventions, which are important from a public health and pandemic perspective, have been focused on much less. Here is a graph, and I'm sorry if this is a scary one for you, but this is the totality of the evidence around so-called physical distancing. So all of these lines represent individual studies that have been done uh, based upon the illness. So MERS, SARS and COVID-19 to the left of the line favours the intervention, in which case it's distancing to the right of the line says that distancing is harmful. What you can see is lots of studies have been done across these three different disease uh, entities. The vast majority of the points are on the left of the line, which favours the intervention, which in this case is distancing. So what this shows is actually there's very good evidence that at least a, a metre difference uh, separating people probably results in a large reduction. By large, I'm talking about a, a, an 80% reduction in infection that occurs. It also shows, which I haven't uh, demonstrated here, that actually the further away one is, um, for every one metre further away, that might double the effect. In other words, two metres is probably at least double as good as one metre. What about masks? So as you would appreciate, masks are a bit of a hot topic, but you can compare this graph with the previous graph. That previous graph showed that there were a large number of studies done. What you can see here is that masks actually there have been relatively few number of studies done and the majority of studies have been in a healthcare environment rather than a community or non-healthcare environment. Again, like the previous graph, most studies, uh, the, the dots, the blobs are to the left of the line, favoring an intervention which suggests that yes, face masks might result in a large reduction. Again, we're, we're talking about probably a, a, an 80% reduction. There are different sorts of masks and the so-called N95 probably are more effective. But what I do want to point out is that all of these data have been done in SARS and the vast majority in healthcare settings where the risk of transmission is naturally much greater than, for example, if you're walking on a beach or by yourself. What about treatment? So treatment is evolving very rapidly. Australia is in a very a good position. We have the National COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force, which has done the work of synthesizing all of that rapid evidence that's emerging and coming up with what so-called living guidelines, which are uh, evidence-based recommendations based upon the most up-to-date evidence. And the bottom line is of the many, many interventions that have been considered, it looks like corticosteroids, which are a very old drug, appear to be the only drug that works. And it primarily works in patients who are receiving oxygen, and it's not because it acts against the virus. It's not an antiviral drug, but it actually damps down the immune system of the individual, which goes back to the point I made earlier, which is actually a lot of the damage is not from the virus directly. It's the, it's their own, it's us trying to get rid of it, which is causing the problem. But even then, the effect is modest. So if we compare this with a pretty impressive response of distancing, what this means is that for every thousand people treated, uh, you might prevent about 50 deaths. Yes, it's important, uh, which means you have to treat around 20 to prevent one death. So yes, it's important, but the effect is relatively modest. Uh, as you will recall, there was a lot of uh, activity and interest around hydroxychloroquine used for malaria, but unfortunately the promise uh, 
did not result in any uh, positive effect. In fact, uh, recently the solidarity trial, which came out about a month ago, was published. This is a very large WHO trial, which compared a whole range of interventions, including hydroxychloroquine. And in fact, if anything, this demonstrates the death from people on hydroxychloroquine is higher than if they weren't receiving it. Uh, remdesivir, which is an direct antiviral, also appeared not to be effective in this particular intervention. So what's the bottom line for the therapies? The bottom line for the therapies is that compared to the preventative interventions, the therapies actually, the effect is relatively modest. Uh, and compared to the very large number of public health interventions that we can attempt, that we can use, uh, therapies uh, have a relatively small place. Finally, what about vaccines? Vaccines are complex. Uh, here's a website from the Australian Academy of Science, which provides hopefully some very useful learning information for you. But in essence, they work by stimulating the body's defense system against the infection in a in a way which is more effective and safer than the natural intervention uh, natural infection normally they take 10 years to develop uh, it's a complex process identifying the relevant part that might work of the particular virus or bacteria evaluate it through large-scale trials and uh, approval process now there's probably around 300 candidate vaccines of which around 30 are in clinical trials, which are the study design so that we can work out whether they really are safe and effective with plans to enroll around 300 participants. So to get uh, appropriate evidence about whether a vaccine works, typically we would need around 40,000 participants. That some of the most advanced candidates are in these large scale trials, uh, and compared to uh, previously, where it was a process in uh, series, development, trial, manufacturing, regulatory approvals, those steps, all of those things are now being compressed and happening currently. You might be aware of some press releases in relation to some promising phase three results but the endpoint data is only around 100 cases and probably too early, albeit encouraging. Uh, our own uh, Professor Nikolai Petrovsky has, is uh, also working importantly in this area. He's done a number of animal studies, which are summarized here, and a human clinical trial, uh, which again does look uh, promising. What's Australia's vaccine strategy? And again, I think it's fair to say that Australia uh, the, has made a very a positive response here, has a number of agreements with a number of vaccine providers. Why is that important? Well, it's likely that uh, we will need more than one vaccine. Also, we don't know which vaccine is going to win. We don't actually know which vaccine is going to be effective. It does require robust data regarding safety and efficacy. Uh, it does require public confidence in the process and the results, and it does require manufacturing and delivery at scale. On the right hand side, you can see a graph demonstrating that there's an awful lot of activity and across all types of uh, vaccines that are uh, being trialed. These are some of the vaccines that are being trialed as part of this COVAX uh, facility. Finally, what about implications for the future? Well, I think what Australia and other countries has demonstrated is that SARS-CoV-2 can be contained. Sure, there is an element of mystery but we now know what actually works and perhaps more importantly that we know as a population that if we do the right thing, then we can minimize the impact on the community. Sure, there will be ongoing clusters. 
this virus will not be able to be eradicated until we have a large scale vaccine rollout, but we know that we have got robust health measures that can be implemented. So what does 2021 bring? Well, I think it will see a continuation of the public health measures um, proportional to the level of risk. A vaccine rollout on an unprecedented scale and that probably in the second half of 2021, we have to bear in mind that the world has never seen a vaccine rollout of this scale. If you think about it at the moment, we might vaccinate some parts of the population, those at risk or newborns, but on a on a scale of 25 million people in Australia, six, seven billion across the world, that's never happened before. So it will need to be staged with people most at risk likely to need it first. SARS-CoV-2 I think is likely to be endemic, which means it's living in the population until, the grow, until there is a global rollout of the vaccine. And we do have a high uptake of an effective vaccine. I say high uptake because it's one thing to have the vaccine, but it's a problem if not as many people take it up as would be required. I do hope that the care for the individual continues. What we have seen uh, individually, I personally have experienced this and I'm sure that many of you have too, is that fundamentally Australians, people care deeply for each other and that's been so much and evident and so positive. I do hope that there will be utilisation of technology for teaching and engagement that flattens it off. Some of my rural and remote colleagues have benefited enormously because everybody is in the same book and it's not just a face to face contact for those privileged to be on site here. I do hope that there will be due focus on disadvantaged groups like every illness. COVID-19 has impacted disadvantaged groups, whether that be age, those with chronic disease uh, or socioeconomically disadvantaged. And finally, I do hope that this will lead to equal attention on the less acute but the bigger public health challenges of chronic disease and global warming with prevention prioritised and not just treatment. So it is a marathon. Uh, having run a few, I feel like we're about a 30 kilometre uh, with about 12 kilometres uh, still to go. But I think there has been some positives. There have been a lot of negatives. I hope this has provided some useful information as you try to adjust personally and professionally that the challenges over the last eight months or so have provided to you. Thank you, Karen. Over to you. Thank you, Jonathan, for that timely explanation and that analysis. Um, now, I understand we have almost 400 participants and we are starting to get uh, quite a few questions coming through from the audience. Um, we'll do our best to answer everybody, uh, but this is intended to be a snapshot session, so we don't want it to linger too long. So, uh, Jonathan, we might be able to add an extra five to ten minutes to get to some of these questions. For those we can't get to your questions, um, please be patient and if you'd like to leave your contact details, we'll respond to you directly. So to get the discussion started, firstly, I'd like to provide an observation from Stacey. Stacey says, cases in residential aged care include staff and residents. It would be useful to see numbers recovered and died for staff and residents separately to underscore the impact on the elderly. So that's something we might be able to provide some data on um, down the track. Uh, then we have some questions um, in relation to testing. In fact, we've got two that I'd like to ask in tandem. Uh, they're both from anonymous right the first is is there any reason why africa is not so affected is it a issue and secondly japan seems to be quite and they don't seem to have the level of testing so how are they doing better than the americas china etc so jonathan could you reflect upon um, how testing and the figures um, should be interpreted by by the public when there is some uncertainty in some instances about levels of testing uh. So, so those are very good points. So, uh, so there was a very, there is a very famous politician who did draw the link uh, between the testing and disease, probably not with the intention of, uh, but but underlying the important thing, which is that unless 
one tests, one cannot find. So we can be relatively confident with the data that is present in Australia for the reasons that I have shown, which is the, the number of tests per positive cases is relatively uh, low compared to other jurisdictions. So in some cases, some other countries, it may well be that the number of cases is an estimate, in some cases a gross underestimate of the magnitude of the effect. If we go back to the uh, Spanish flu pandemic, the data in relation to how many people were actually affected is relatively unknown because the public health practices to measure and report uh, vary substantially across the world. So in some cases, I would say that the number of cases is a representation of the, uh, the under testing that has occurred. Uh, in other cases, it may reflect actually a very robust uh, public health uh, system. Uh, irrespective of the frequency with uh, testing. So Karen, it's difficult to you know, draw comparisons from country to country, uh, but in some cases artifactual due to testing, in some cases uh, uh, representing real robust public health and individual responses that inhabitants have made. And we have a follow up question from um, Amanda, which actually speaks, I think, a little to this testing question. And um, she asked where she can find reputable sources of information about SARS-CoV-2, the virus itself, and how it infects, slashes, transmits, such as that, that you offered at the start of the talk. So I, I do wonder whether we could post that um, information online, um, along with the recorded session so that people can um, access sure. that directly there. Yeah. Now I we think that goes. So just one thing, uh, Karen, if I might say so. What, what what's so important here is, uh, as you said, reputable sources of, of information. And uh, as I also indicated, the amount of new information that is emerging is, you know, frankly mind boggling. So I would encourage uh, people online to go to reputable sources of information, which is the Commonwealth Department of Health COVID site and the state or territory Department of COVID, uh, Department of Health, depending on where they happen to be. That's a good place to start. Great. Now we have a couple of follow-up questions from uh, various writers. Uh, one from Rebecca, what are your thoughts on the potential mutation rate and what impact it will have on vaccine development? And another from an anonymous writer, what about the virus evolving? Is there any evidence that the virus is changing and will the vaccine have to be adapted for different strands of COVID-19? Yeah, so those are two uh, interesting questions and have been considered. As, as I understand it, actually the rate of mutation has been relatively uh, modest. Uh, I think that a lot of this is relatively uncertain because we don't even know whether we have a vaccine that's going to be effective yet and whether it will change over time. There's some evidence that suggests that the virus is relatively stable. This might vary with the flu vaccine because you'd be aware that every year a different flu vaccine is required. Uh, early data suggests that that may not be the case with this particular virus, but time will tell. We have a question in relation to the percentage of vaccine uptake that would be required to have the desired effect. That's from Cameron. And also uh, an anonymous question, um, what do we say to people who won't get vaccinated because of things such as it was rushed or they don't know what the long-term effects say 20 or 30 years into the future might yeah. be? So, so, you know, hmm. so again, a uh, very good question. So. Given that we don't know much about this virus and its response to vaccination, this is relatively unknown. Uh, but what I would say on first principles that one doesn't get the so-called herd immunity, that is benefit at a, uh, a population level over and above the impact on individuals, which makes the environment so frankly hostile to the virus that it can no longer transmit from individual to individual and that's probably ar around uh, 90 percent. Now uh, so people people 
process information in very different ways. The last eight months has been very evident to this, but what I would encourage everybody when they have discussions with people is to just look at the evidence in relation to the effects of the vaccine. The government is not going to roll out a vaccine unless there's robust evidence, both of its safety and also its effectiveness. Uh, vaccination is not a new concept and indeed has probably been the one thing that's been most effective in ridding humanity of all sorts of nasty infections, be that polio, measles, uh, in fact, very many things. So I think we, we just have to encourage people to go back to the, 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 the evidence and indeed uh, um, robust advice that comes from state and Commonwealth jurisdictions. We are fast running out of time and uh, this is meant to be a quick session. So I'm going to ask one more question, but I do note that there are probably another half a dozen to eight that we haven't got to, and we will endeavour to answer them online. Um, but this final question is, is there any evidence that the virus could remain over the long term within an individual, such as in cells found within the heart, for example, or perhaps even the eye? Do you have any insights into that? Because, uh, so again, a great, great question. So. Uh, some viruses, such as some of the herpes viruses, which cause shingles, do live in a part of the body, right? So they live in parts of the nervous system and so they reactivate. There is no evidence that this particular virus does that. Once it's eradicated from the body, then it's eradicated. Uh, the, the reinfection, which are another infection which occurs after one's had the first infection seems to be very, very uncommon. So um, I think that's going to be relatively unlikely. Great. Now, look, I think we will wrap it up. Um, uh, I would like to just give a very quick run through of some of the other questions that we've received so that people understand that, yes, we have received them and people can give some thought to um, how we might respond, but also check online to follow up um, the answers. We will post them there, and particularly if you leave your name and you want to be contacted directly for, for more information, we're very happy to do that. Just to say, of course, very happy to uh, answer any questions offline uh, people might have, um, but again, because health advice does vary by state by state, uh, I would refer people back to their local uh, jurisdiction for specific advice. Thanks everyone for joining us.